in your kit, you're going to find a couple of pieces. There are three different sizes of material. There's one sixteenth inch of thickness, one thirty second, and one sixty fourth. The one sixty fourth is a slightly darker shade. It's all the small pieces. It's all the trim and window pieces and things like that. The uh, you'll see some long rectangles like this here. They've got some lines running across them. Those are your roof pieces. Those lines are references for putting your shingles on later, which I will bring next month. I on, intentionally did not bring you some of the pieces because I don't want anybody working ahead. That's been a problem in the past. And the whole idea of doing this is not just to teach you what the order is to put it together, but to also teach you some of the tricks I use when putting together a kit. Just set that there. So what we're going to work with, this, this first piece here, the larger rectangle, is your floor. You'll notice it has a blank spot in the center, and then it has scribing around the outer edge. Uh, for Daryl, who is working along with us today, I believe, yours actually has the flooring engraved since you wanted the interior in yours. The rest of the walls, you have two peaked walls that are identical. They have two windows in them, two rectangular windows and one circular window. Those are the two end walls. You'll have two small walls like this. These are the walls for the bay window that we'll have to sand an, ang an angle on. And then you're going to have two longer rectangular walls. These are both what we're going to start with. We're going to start with one of these walls, and we're going to start with one of the peaked walls. Okay? So pick the wall that has the freight door on one end, a man door down here flanked by two windows. If you've got the wall that has another wall piece cut inside one of the cutouts, that's not the one. That's going to be your homework. We're going to work on the bay window next month. Blank. Yes, sir. Can we talk about this wall right here? That's the one for homework. For homework? Yes. You want this wall. Okay. Yes, sir. I don't think I got a floor. These are... Do what? I don't think I got a floor. A floor? There wasn't a floor in your bag? Okay. I'll bring you one next month. Um, in fact, let me make a list. Dwight, these are flipped. Uh, Dwight, do you have a uh, big floor? What yours is. is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there's no interior, so it's not going to be that big a deal. Right? Yeah. It doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. That's weird. I wonder how the heck that happened. What happened? This wall got flipped on there. <coughs> tell, tell you what. If your wall is flipped from mine, if you want it different, let me know, and I will cut you a replacement for it. I don't know how it got flipped. Is that what it's supposed to look like? It sh it's it's you should be man door on the left or uh, freight door on the left, man door on the right. Okay, you, that's the wrong wall. Wrong wall. I think everybody's just flipped. So Dwayne here is just wrong. Okay, hang on. A second. So the first thing we want to do is pop the doors out and the window openings out. And give you an idea just how easy this really is, all I do is I go along the grain, even though it's plywood, grain's still somewhat important, I pull it and then push it back and it pops right out. If it, like I say, if it doesn't, don't try to force it. Uh, that's for one like that has an opening in it. Like there, I just pop the man door out. For a window, I'll hold it up, pop a thumb on either side of it, and give it a little bit of light pressure, you'll hear it snap and pop right out. Again, if it doesn't, turn it over. You'll see one side, I don't know if you can see it on the screen or not. We've got one side here with a really dark burn line on it. Right there. If you flip it over, see how faint that burn line is? Okay, the faint side was the, is the part that was laying down in the machine. So it actually has the least amount of burn through, okay? So if you do have to cut one out because it doesn't want to pop out, turn it over to that faint line side take your number 11 or a scalpel and just make a light scoring pass down each cut, but they should all pop out. It didn't get through. Okay, let's get started again. Step number two. We want to very lightly do a little bit of edge sanding. 
Now the problem is most people grab it and just start sanding back and forth. Let me tell you a little, a little hint here. When you do that, I don't care how meticulous you are, I don't care how careful you are, you will put more pressure with one finger than another and you're going to sand an angle into it. Whenever you're sanding on something, and this goes for like if you build a building and you push on the corners and it rocks back and forth, take you a piece of glass and glue down a piece of 220 grit and then take the whole building and rub it in a circle. That will sand it flat without sand, because if you just do this with it back and forth, your building's going to end up leaning because you're going to sand away more on one edge than the other. So what you want to do, if you, if you feel, rub your, edge, your finger down the edge, you should, if it feels a little rough, give it a very light little scrubbing, just round some little bitty circles, it won't take a whole lot. All that is is a little bit of the char. The way the laser works is there's three power settings. There's power, speed, and pulses per inch. And the three combined give you your cut, okay? And what I've found is if I leave just a little bit of that char in there and space the pulses a little further apart, it holds the pieces in without them all falling out in most cases. Sometimes, like I say, if the thing picks up a bit of a warp, we have the problem we had like cutting out some of the windows. But don't get overly aggressive with it. It only takes a couple of really light circles to get that to come off. you're using sandpaper that's fine I also like using emery boards you can buy these things over at Sally Beauty Supply things like that a file will work uh, as long as you got a really fine file uh, I buy these things over at Sally's and, they, and the nice part is is it's not like buying the old emery boards back when I was a kid where you just bought an emery board they come in all sorts of different grits now you can get them all the way out to a couple of thousand for polishing if you want these things I use them in my wood shop I, I, do all kinds of projects with them. These are great for getting in and all the little nooks and crannies when I'm building a harp or a guitar or furniture or working on models or whatever. You don't have to get them out of the cheap. Sally. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you, you buy some at yeah, Walmart. Walmart. Well, the thing about going to like a Sally or something like that, uh, and if you really get lucky, you find a place that does, that supplies the nail salons and stuff like that. And it's like going to a restaurant supply. You know, you can you can buy it kind of in bulk. So, um, in fact, along with when I'm thinking about it, as long as restaurant supply. I bought this box over at Ace Restaurant Supply over in Garland. It's a thousand wooden coffee stirring sticks that are five and a half inches long. And this particular Santa Sure brand right here measures out to be a two by 12. In, in HO, wooden sticks. A two by 12. Yeah. So I've got some at my office that are uh, three sixteenths of an inch wide. So for those of us who build an S scale every once in a while, it's a perfect foot wide there. And they come now that everybody's got the really tall coffee cups. You can find them in seven and eight inch long lengths, depending on your restaurant supply. So, but uh, that box right there has a thousand of them in it. Was two dollars and some change. So, and I've got two boxes of them up here. I'll be giving you guys some of these for reinforcement pieces and stuff if you want. <coughs> Yeah, and then uh, Daryl's got a bag of uh, material that he bought over at Hobby Lobby. Yeah, this was $3.99 for $500. Yeah. Uh, these sticks, these measure out 8 by 8 by 19 and a half feet long. It's $3.99 for $500. Yeah, they're, and it's kind of like a matchstick almost. Yeah. yeah. And, but yeah, you can find these over in Hobby Lobby. Um, they're back in the area where they've got the wooden boxes and all the unpainted wood craft and things like that. And they've got several different sizes too. I've got two or three bags that I bought, of, and it's and the fun, nice part is they're not always straight. So if you want to have rough cut lumber at your sawmill or something like that, four bucks does all the lumber you need around a sawmill pretty easily. That's why I like the cutter from Northwest South Shore because yep. you can cut them to different things. Exactly. All right, has everybody got their stuff sanded and ready to ready to paint? Yep. All right. I like using craft paint. This stuff's cheap. It comes a lot in a bottle. A bottle will last you for years and years and years. And it comes in almost every color under the rainbow. Now, Randy, you're going to be painting for years, brother. <laughs> you need a two-inch house brush and a gallon of bear. <laughs> or a spray kit. Yeah, there you go. Now, if you are working with solid wood in a kit, you really need to paint both sides. Okay? Because it will warp. 
You also need to have some weight available of some sort. A bo the bottle of paint actually works as a really nice weight as well, but you can go up to the engineering squares and things like that, but just anything that will help hold it flat. The plywood that this is cut out of, you don't necessarily have to. It's probably not a bad idea, but it just doesn't warp because it gets wet quite like the other does. Now, I will tell you this, and this is the reason why I didn't want anybody jumping ahead and painting ahead. I'll shake this up real good, and then I work out of the bottle cap, okay? And I'm going to take a fairly wide brush, and I'm going to get just the tips of the paintbrush with any paint on it, okay? Now, I like my buildings to be a little grimy, i.e., in some cases, the paint is the only thing holding the building together is the look I'm going for in some cases. This, I want to look a little bit more moderately weathered. I want it to look lived in but not filthy. If you want to go for the filthy look, follow these. Get just the tips of your brush wet, so you're going to do a dry brush effect. While you have the bulk of the paint, start at the top of the wall and scrub your way down. Okay? The most of the paint will be on the top of the wall because it's up underneath the eave. It's being protected from the weather and it's not going to have rain on it all the time. It's not going to have snow piled up against it but you are literally gonna dry brush all of this. Do not stick your butt, and I, and I say this because I had this happen over in Division Three. I started talking about painting one. I saw a guy take a brush this big, drop it until the bristles hit the bottom of the bucket, bring it up until it stopped dripping, and then starts troweling paint on. He paint, He put enough paint on that model that he could have painted every model in the room. <laughs> As the paint starts wearing off the brush, as you start coming down, that's a good thing. You don't, if you're going for a really weathered look, you don't want a lot of paint on the bottom of this because we're going to come back in and stain it and weather it here in a little bit. Or you have the opportunity to do that. So I'm, the other idea with dry brushing it too, it's, it's not that I'm cheap and I don't want to spend any more on paint than I have to, which is the case. Um, but it also doesn't, it doesn't have me putting more wet materials on this wall than I have to. And again, the more it gets wet, the more potential you have to warp. So I like to keep it as dry as I can, as long as I can. Now the idea of doing this before we start any assembly is you want to be able to set this down and put some weight on it and work on it as much as we can while it's what we call in the flat. So that means if you do get it wet with a lot of uh, weathering stain or something like that, you have an opportunity to put some weight on it and let it dry. Now, one of the things that a lot of modelers forget to do is paint the insides of the windows and the doors. So be sure not to miss those. Just takes a little bit of paint on the end of the brush. You're going to come in and just a few little quick strokes because a good chunk of that is going to show. Does crap paint have no water in it? Then, uh, We're not painting both sides here, right? Don't have to. Can if you want. Another thing, if you're working with a solid wood kit and you go to put lights in it, you definitely want to paint both sides because the light will bleed through and then you get to explain why your walls glow. With plywood, you don't have that worry. What I was going to say is, is there more water in acrylic or in the craft paint? Uh, the craft paint is in acrylic. Oh, so, okay. kind of samey samey. There will be a watered down version of acrylic. Yeah. Yep. Now, one of the things you can do if you've uh, started playing around with pan pastels, uh, one of the guys that sells these at the Narrow Gauge Convention actually has an instructional DVD where he goes through and he builds a structure that's a kit that he also sells, and every bit of color on that model is done with pan pastels. The wood, the, the rock for his field stone wall, everything is done with pan pastels. So it is an option. Um, I've played with the pan pastels just a little bit. I haven't gotten real serious with them yet. 
but uh, that is an option if you don't want to paint. When you saw those hoppers of mine, that was all uh, dry powder. Yep. No paint, except for the quirky. Now, right now, if Bill Hubner was here, Bill would be having a stroke because we didn't prime this first. Um, when I'm working with wood, I don't worry about priming it. And the reason for that is I don't want any additional thickness in, in layers of paint. I also don't want the thing to have a uniform coat of paint on it because I'm going to hit this with some alcohol and sta uh, alcohol based stains and the stains are going to look different and it won't look like bare wood that's been weathered if it has primer all over it first. So I do just the paint coats. The other advantage of working in small thin dry brush type work is it dries very very quickly. And I have just enough ADD to not want to have to wait any more than I have to. My dad told me one time when I was working on a project, and I was like, when can I do the next step? He said, son, you're going to have to learn some patience. And I went, yeah, okay, patience. How long is that going to take? <laughs> like they always taught you in shop class, go with the grain. Don't be scrubbing the paint around and stuff like that. And again, nice, thin coats. Once in a while, you'll I put the lid back on it, shake the bottle back up a little bit, get a little more paint in the lid. Yeah, if they just had duct tape, you'd be set. You'd be good for the apocalypse. Oh yeah. A red green brother. Yep. I knew where you were going. Handyman's secret weapon. Hey Joe. The duct tape's like the force. It has a light side, a dark side, and it binds the galaxy together. A well weathered structure, yes. It just said make sure it's a well weathered you know, it's 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 really gonna be old. I don't want some of those. Really yep. I finally found something Gorilla Tape won't hold for nothing. Really? What's that? Uh, I have a uh, yeah, I have a metal ex a collapsible hose that goes on the end of the blower of the laser, yeah. and I had it duct taped to the um, end of the blower nozzle because the clamp for it didn't make the move for some reason, and. Uh, it does not like, I guess there's just not enough surface on that collapsible metal hose for it to hold itself on there. And uh, so I'm going to, uh, I just got to go buy a big radiator clamp, all I need to do. Now this particular kit I'm building will end up on Mr. Mackey's layout. Maybe. You have to remember who's actually building the layout. Yeah, yeah Palmer, Palmer and, and Richardson, right? <laughs> Mostly Palmer. 
I'm not even yeah, acknowledging. It, 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 it depends on whether or not the structure actually merits. If it doesn't merit, it ain't going on the layout. That's that, and and quite honestly, he he's joking, but he's serious because my taste in structures has increased over the last few years. That's a good thing because the stuff you had on there before was junk. How big is Jeff's new train room? Uh, <laughs> Jeff's new train room is 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 fifty five by fifteen. <laughs> The problem is he put Jeff's train room on the other side of Fort Worth. Yeah. In my house. <laughs> Didn't I consider it? Bought one of his buddies a train room. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff has been a godsend. A lot of folks in this room have been a godsend. Randy, Joe Lysing, John Garfield, Jeff, Randy, uh, Ray, Wheeler. Okay, now just just so you I guys know, I've know, forgotten somebody. I'm me. sure you're pretty few are probably still catching up with me, but you Jeremy, yeah. Uh, all I did to clean this brush out was I ran it around in some water a little bit, scraped the excess off because I'm going to be using this brush again here in a bit, and then I dried it off on a paper towel, and then I went back with my thumb and my finger, and reshaped the bristles. <coughs> if you don't do this and you let them all sit out there all scraggled out. It's going to stay that way when it dries, and the next thing you know, you got all kinds of little flyaway lashes in this thing that are going to become a problem in your next paint job. And when you're done, we'll wash them out with soap and water. I like that. Isn't that cool? Hot. And it collapses. So I mean, it's only about that thick when it's stored. Oh, I, it thought that was, I thought it was ceramic. Thing. No, no, that's rubber. Is that right? Yeah. I bought that. Yeah. Where did you get it? I want to say Michael's. I've had it for years. But yeah, real, real handy. Like I say, the whole thing. Have you talked about this? No, I haven't gotten around. I'm about, I'm about to once we get the painting part. <coughs> now, one of the things I did not include on your parts list because I didn't know how dirty everybody wanted to get their stuff was weathering stains. Typically, if I'm going to do stains, I do it at this point in the process. Now, that's not to say you can't take this home and do it later. You'll just have to do it a little slower because you'll need to put it on. And because what we're going to, when you go home today, we're, the idea is you're going to have these two walls glued together. We're going to make an L shape. Then you're, when you get home, your homework before next month is to get all your other parts and pieces cut out, get those painted, and glue those into the other L shape. And then we'll, uh, we'll talk about taking those and put them together. The idea here is, is, and I always think of this whenever you're approaching a structure, you're going to have some that are going to be oddly shaped and you're going to have different substructures and things like that, <coughs> but always think of it as the L7 method. I make an L, I make a 7, then I glue them together. So you work them in that order. Now while you guys are finishing your painting, I'll talk a little bit about the staining and stuff uh, part of it. Again, this is something you can do at home. But I'll go ahead and talk about it now so you've got a little bit of background in it. Uh, a lot of the, the stains I like to use are from Hunter Line. Uh, these are really, really good stains. He's got, what, probably three, four different, uh, dozen different colors. Yes. Uh, and it's all kinds of different colors. It's browns, it's blacks. He's got yellows and greens and reds and just you name it. And I brought a handful of them. I've, I've got probably a couple of dozen different colors myself. Um, Mike wants this building to look a little lived in but not actually completely trashed out. The other option is the old standby, alcohol and India ink. Now, I'm going to make a pitch. You may have heard me say this before. Alcohol is, I try, don't let this label here fool you that says 70%. This has the 90% stuff in it. More alcohol means less water, less water means less warping. It also means faster drying. Uh, also, then this was the important part. Not all India ink is the same. Most India inks, it's not really truly a black. It is a very exceedingly dark blue. If you have fluorescent lights in your train room, your beautiful dark stains when you carry them in there will be purple. The only black that I know of that you can get, especially shoot, now India, India ink is black, okay? But if you start talking about leather dyes, uh, the only one that I know for certain is Jet Black, is USMC Black. Has nothing to do with the Marine Corps, but that's the best way to remember it. 
tandy leather dyes, all those things, they are a dark, dark blue. And your again, your stains will look purple. Ask me how I know this. Um, yeah, uh, Speedball, and there's another one that Hobby Lobby carries. I'm trying to remember the name. Yeah, yeah, and those will both work. There's a company called Angelus that makes leather dyes, and uh, Luthier, a friend of mine up in Chicago that also makes guitars, um, he uh, he uses it for staining guitar tops, and he says their black is black. I have not tried it yet, so. Right. Right, for to put in the resins? Yeah, and that stuff works really great. Thin it down and you thin it with alcohol? It's black. Okay, cool. They got all any color you want. Excellent. Um, one of the things I do with my alcohols, and it's hard to read it now, but that actually says light on it um, with a magic marker. I've got about five different bottles sitting on my workbench with different amounts of everything from a teaspoon to the whole pint to three or four teaspoons to the pint depending on how dark I want it to be and then after I measure that out I took a piece of foam core board and a piece of, of strip wood about this size here actually this is two boards so it's about half this thickness here <coughs> and I cut a piece about three inches long and dip it in the ink and let it dry and then I glue it to that piece of foam core board and I write on it the recipe basically for how much uh, India ink went into that bottle of alcohol and then I number them or I lay, uh, I've gone to numbering them because the writing you can't read that now hardly unless you get it in the right light um, so I'll look at it and I'll, go, and I'll hold and I'll basically well, it's called creating a storyboard is what they call it so I'll take that storyboard and I'll hold it up to the model and just kind of go okay I want it to look that messed up that's number three and I'll just take it out and you can write the number on the top of the lid pretty easily that that works out pretty well <coughs> and all I'm really going to do with this is uh, grab my other brush that I set right here and get a little bit on this and then I turn the wall upside down and I work from the bottom up because you don't want it to be weathered up underneath the eave. That is the number one <laughs> with a bullet mistake that most modelers make is they'll go in and they'll weather it all the way to the top. Go outside on any old barn uh, that really has been beat up over the years, and I'll bet you the top foot of that wall looks brand new in almost every case. Now, one thing I will warn, when you're working with this alcohol-based stain, it will reactivate the paint just a little bit, so you have to be careful with it. But even that's not necessarily a bad thing because it allows you to do a little bit of blending between the layers. So if you don't go all the way up and you come back in and you start adding a little more to it later, you'll get a demarcation line in there if you're not real careful with it. Well, by, by reactivating the paint some, you can blend that out. And that's probably even a little darker than Mike's going to want this would be my bet. What do you think? No, that's fine. Okay. So again, you can go back and do this step at the house if you want to. I'm also going to cover a couple of other different options as well that we, you can do. And it all depends. If you've got a Class A railroad that you're trying to model, I mean, like Mr. Grind there does the New York Central. Yeah. In, they, 19, in 1965, when it's like dead. Yeah. So that's the and that's the thing to keep in mind. How active was your railroad? How well did they take care of their equipment? If you're freelancing like I do, then it's solely up to you. Your railroad, your rules. <coughs> I do. Uh, September 1957 out in southwestern Colorado. A um, couple of the railroads in real life were gone by then. Um, I've got a whole fictitious made up BS story as to why they're still around in my time frame that I can bore you with later. Uh, but the railroads out there started developing some problems after the uh, government repealed the Sherman Silver Purchase Act back in the 1890s. And what ended up happening was that the treasury was bound to mint so many pure silver coins for every gold coin. So it kept the mines where they were just making money hand over fist. And when they repealed that, most of the mines went out of business and sadly took the railroads with them. So by the time a lot of these died off in the 50s, 
the like I said earlier, the paint was about the only thing holding some of the freight cars together. They were in really rough shape. And it is amazing to me that so much of it has survived as long as it has over the years. Good paint. <laughs> yep. Good paint and the sweat and tears of a lot of good people who have worked in those museum pieces now all these years. And see, that's another thing, too. If you're working on a freight car, for example, those old wooden freight cars, railroads never painted the bottoms of them. Underneath, that's raw wood because it costs money to put paint underneath there. It costs money to pay somebody to put paint underneath there. So you're dealing with a situation where, you know, copper wire was invented by railroads stretching pennies, you know? So those things were never painted. Now, if you crawl underneath one in Chama or Durango, now you're gonna go, huh, Dwayne's wrong. You crawl underneath at the Railroad Museum in Golden, you're gonna go, huh, Dwayne was wrong. No, the museum painted them because they wanted to protect their investment. They want to keep their pieces together. So they're trying to keep the artifacts where they'll last for another 150 years. So they've gone through and done the things to them that the railroads wouldn't. Right, it's kind of hard to see on the screen. On sure. The books. Can you bring that around? Yeah, exactly. I can do that while you guys are working. So the bottom of the wall is always going to be a little more beat okay. up than the top. Okay. And I may come back in and lighten this up a little bit. In fact, I'll even do some of that, and I can just kind of demo how I'm going to do it. What color did you paint originally? Oh, I'm going to do it What color did you paint originally? Like this color? It is, um, yeah, it's a craft yellow. Right? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. the color I went with is uh, yeah, folk art, and it's called, I think it's called French Vanilla. Yeah, it's called French Vanilla. It's kind of similar. It kind is of almost dead on rare for Depot Buff. Yeah. Tastes great. <coughs> No, 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 because I, like I say, I'm, I'm dry brushing, I want that detail to pop, because I'm not going to go back and put the battens on it, I'll come around. If you're going to put battens on it, how do you do, you wait until uh, you get the battens on and do it? Yep. You can go back in and add the battens after you've already painted, but I typically add them before. Yeah, unless you want the building to look relatively new, don't need to use a whole lot of paint. Uh, I won't. I'll give a little more, and I'm going to weather some of it. I'm going to bring some of that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, no, I got this. This is a Hobby Lobby. Uh, apple, apple Barrel, I think, is uh, Hobby Lobby. Yeah, Apple Barrel, Folk Art, Ceramic Coat. Um, Americana. Yeah, Americana. Deco Art. Yeah, in, yeah, Deco Art makes about six or seven different flavors. And any or all of them are perfectly acceptable. Now, as I lean across the camera so you can't see anything but my back, I'm going to reach in here and grab some colored pencils. This is another weathering option that you have available. It's not something you'd want to do full on color for, but for weathering, this is really, really handy. And what I have in here is just about every color that you could imagine, but I've got a couple in particular that I really like when I'm working with this buff color. Um, these are from Prismacolor. Prismacolor makes two different kinds of pencils. They make one that's a watercolor and one that isn't and you want the one that isn't, okay? You can buy these piecemeal at Hobby Lobby and Michael's. You can order them online. You can buy them in big sets, which is how I got all the pencils that are in here. Now, this big leather case didn't come with it. I bought that aftermarket, but to give you an idea, this is just one side of it. But look at all the different colors. And again, that's only half the set that I bought. Uh, watch for them on eBay. Um, these things normally go in the sets about a dollar, dollar and a half a pencil. If you're buying them individually, they're about two bucks a pencil. They do last a long time. But there really is an advantage to these because you can sharpen them up to a fairly fine point and you can get down in all the little nooks and crannies and really throw some neat weathering and highlighting in it. And what I've got right here to go along with this buff, I've got one called Sand, I've got one called Jasmine, and then I've got this one that's called Cream. Cream in this Depot buff is light. 
It is light reflecting off if you do a clapboard building. I'll come along with this cream and run it along the outer edge. So the clapboard's got the piece there, it's at an angle, right? right? Along the very bottom of that clap piece, I take this pencil on its side and run it just across that very top outer facing edge on the side that's gonna be facing the light in my train room. So if your lights face from left to right, I'm gonna put it across the left and the front face of that structure. I'm not going to worry about the other side in the back because this is sunlight. These other two colors are just more for more shadowing and things like that. You don't have to press in them real hard. Uh, you just want to come in. I typically get them fairly sharp and then I come back and I use the sides of them. And all I'm doing is just with the grain putting a little bit of pressure on it, not a lot. Uh, if, you, if you get to the point where you make a full pass and you go, yep, I can see it, you're pressing too hard. You really want to make a lot of very light little passes because a little of this goes a long, long way. And you're going to build them up. I typically work from the darkest to the lightest. I just realized I had the medium pencil in my hand, so I'm going back. Um, I know a lot of modelers, uh, if you get a chance to see Brett Galland do his uh, weathering of castings clinic that he's going to be doing at the LSR, I wholeheartedly recommend you go to that clinic. It is fantastic. Um, he works from light to dark. Um, Dave Revelia works from light to dark. Um, my mom paints in oils, does murals and, and portraiture and things like that. And she beat it into me as a young kid. You work from dark to light because the darks are where your shadows are. And I've, short of Brett and Dave, I've never seen anybody that does it light to dark and it look right because then your shadows are up on top and not down on the bottom where they're supposed to be you know uh, they do it and it works so i'm actually going to take dave's clinic again or uh, uh, brett's clinic again and uh, go back through it and i'm going to give his technique a rip mainly because i really feel like my casting painting is probably my biggest achilles heel in my modeling set right now and you want to rip all against your mouth <laughs> so <laughs> no, I get along with my folks pretty well. They're both pretty laid back. <laughs> Another weathering option is things like Bragdon powders. I've got a few in there. Um, old makeup is good. Yeah, old makeup, as long as it doesn't have mica in it. That's the trick. If it does, then you're going to get sparkly things in your in your deal. As long as there's no mica in it, it's really, really good. My wife actually has gone through a few things. She, it, my wife was a dance teacher and dancer for a long time, and my daughter's in theater, and so we've got a lot of stage makeup that floats around the house, and there'll be one of those, they'll buy something and be like, nope, this isn't going to work, and I'm like, let me see that before you pitch it. So, yeah, I've got a few, I've got a few deals of, of uh, makeup floating around in different places. <laughs> hey, no joke, man. I played in, in hard rock and metal bands when I was in college and high school back in the 80s. And if I'd have known then that here we are 30 years later, I'd still be buying Aquanet like crazy. I'd have bought stock in the company. No joke. Five guys in the band, you went through a can of Aquanet a night. <laughs> And thus why they refer to it sometimes as hair metal. Yeah, we'll do all the trim next time. Now you'll notice I didn't mention uh, sanding the, the facing surface of it first. I don't like doing that. Uh, I know a lot of modelers uh, talk about, you know, sanding everything first. Uh, it makes it too smooth and it makes it too uniform and it takes all the character out of it to me. Um, I like it to be a little bit rough. Uh, I know guys that won't buy northeastern scale lumber because they say it's too fuzzy. Mm -hmm. they'll, buy, they'll pay the extra money and import it from Mount Albert. I like Mount Albert's lumber. Do not get me wrong. I buy it and I use it. But for anything that's facing the outside, I kind of like the northeastern stuff because it's a little fuzzy. I can do a very faint light sand on it and still has some texture to it and that helps you when you're weathering later on. It makes it look authentic. All right, I'm gonna walk around with these now that I've done some pencil work on them and uh, show these to you and I'll do a little bit of water there. So it's 
weather it's cleaned back just a little bit. I probably should have done one left one undone. Okay, okay. If I've been thinking about it. But literally all I'm doing is I'm just coming in here with this thing turned on its side and just popping in just a little bit of color. And you don't need just a whole lot in here. And it's just little hints here, little hints there. That's all you gotta do. So they make several different like you did yours in white. They make probably eight or ten different shades of white. Off whites and creams and things like that. And all of them. Yeah, it's that, that's the same color. Antiques, right? Oh, antique white? Okay. Yeah. Are you just going to grooves or anything? Well, like this one where it's real light, I'm not going to get down the grooves because I don't want to hide those. But like that spot right there where it's really dark and it's kind of high up, I'm going to come back in and I'm going to lighten that up just a little bit so it doesn't carry all the way to the top. You can see it's almost a perfect match and it kind of makes it disappear a little bit. Yeah, it'll never not be red. But cool. Now, when you're working with these colored pencils, you can take it and soak them in white vinegar for anywhere from 30 seconds to a couple of minutes, and it softens up whatever this material is, the, the lead of the pencil, for lack of a better description. So if you've got some really delicate stuff, you can almost paint the stuff on depending on how long you let this thing soak. Uh, I got this from the military modelers. Uh, if you go out to a site called Missing Links, L Y N X dot com, this is where I picked up the Prisma Colored Colored Pencils. Uh, it is a really neat site. If you think we like our stuff dirty, we don't even begin to touch what the guys in the military modelers do. And some of it doesn't translate down into the smaller scales. For what, uh, for what, like uh, Ken's doing here in O scale, it works because most of the military stuff is either an O or bigger. You know, in, in, in scale, mud is a little bit of stain or a little bit of paint. In HO, it's still just a little bit of paint or a little bit of, of stain. You just keep sticking the hair? Yeah. So I, I, did, I did almost all of this. <coughs> I see a few different colors in there. It's hard to like. You know, this one here, I'll come back in and color that back in. I see it's a little too dark, a little too high up. You caught me there for a minute. This coil is going to get stopped for just a second. If I could bring some of that back, you need to find a pencil that's the same shade as your brown. Like say so you can get up against the window castings and things like that. Okay, good, perfect, 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 perfect. Right. Terry here is working. I am going to use one thing to keep in mind, guys. If you want good results out of your paint, you need good paint brushes. Cheap little paint brushes don't work out as well, and it's going to reflect it in your results of what you're working on. Spend the money and buy a good paintbrush. You can buy them over at Hobby Lobby and you catch them on sale a lot of times. Uh, keep an eye on it. When you walk by the paintbrush aisle, stick your head in there. They'll a lot of times have them marked off certain brands off to half price. When they do that, I go through and I pick them up. Hobby Lobby also goes through and grabs ones that have been hanging on the rack for a number of weeks or months and they'll put them over in the clearance section and you can get them for a couple of dollars. Yeah. And when I do that, I go back there and literally go through, if they've got 25 or 30 of them, there's a good chance I'm going home with 25 or 30, 25 or 30 of them. <laughs> um, yeah, and Michaels will do it too. So, so, so Dwayne, what, so what sizes of, or types of brushes do you recommend? Everything. Uh, everything from the teeny tiny little uh, little spotters that you can do like a, an odd or a double odd or a triple odd are really good for painting small figures and things like that up to um, flat brushes that are anywhere from as narrow as I can get them all the way up to about a, almost half an inch. I like fan brushes as well where you'll see them where they'll start off and they'll do this. Kind of like spread out your fingers out. Yep. These are great for doing all kinds of things. You, you can take like a design <laughs> preservations model and you can shoot it a generic gray come back in with a lighter gray and get it uh, on the edge of that fan brush and do it like a dry brushing effect and then you take it and you twist it as you're going up it and it will drag the streaks around and it makes a great looking marble building. So what kind of, uh, what's the brush bristle, what, what bristle do you look for? Anything. Anything? Anything. Uh, preferably not nylon. 
with the so design. like foxtail and red sable something like that. Yeah, all of them work. If it's good, if it's good enough for an artist to paint with acrylic or oils, it's good enough for us to use a model railroad. Not this brand here. Yeah, those, those are probably nylon bristles would be my guess from looking at the brush. And yeah, now one of the things that Terry's doing, he got his paint a little thick in a couple of places, so he's going back in with his number eleven, turning it the cut side backwards and he's dragging just the tip backwards down the score line to clean the paint out of it. So if you've done that, you want to clean them up, that's a good way to go about doing it. This is just mainly just removing the paint. So see what I've done here with these fences, I can come back in where I'm right in here where I got it dark a little high. I can come back in with this one because it's almost a dead ringer to the color. And I can take it back. But all I did is I worked it from the bottom up. These things work out really, really nicely. Now another option for weathering, and I'm just going to talk about it, I won't demo it today, but another option would be like Bragdon weathering powders, as I trip over the chair. And these things come in all sorts of different colors. You can get them in rusts and browns and grays and everything else. You can use these. Now, this is kind of like doing the old school uh, where you powder up pas uh, pastel sticks and you put it on. But here's a very important thing to know. With the old pastels, you over weathered it because when you sealed it, most of it would melt away. It'd be gone. And it took years of experience of doing it and undoing it and repainting to get that balance because you would either over weather it and it wouldn't melt away enough and then it's too dark so then you paint it all over again and then you don't weather it quite as high and then it melts away too much and then it's still not dark enough and then you add a little more to it this stuff does not melt away at all the harder you rub it the better it stays so a little it's like bro cream a little goes a long way a little dab will do you okay now i will tell you this most of us belly up to our modeling benches anymore, and I'm as guilty of this as anybody. I have a white shirt at the house that has a perfect demarcation line where my belly hits my modeling bench, and from that line up about this far is rusty. And from that point down, it's still white. Because I was flipping that powder around, working on a model, doing it really quickly, and wasn't being overly careful with it, and ended up with a bunch of it on my shirt. Windex will take it out of your shirt. Windex will stick acrylic paint out of your pants. Again, ask me how I know this. Because <laughs> it always happens, you know, we need to go, we need to go. We're supposed to be there in 30 minutes. I'll be ready in a minute, you know. And you're sitting there waiting and you're sitting there waiting and you finally give up. You crawl behind your modeling bench thinking I'm gonna get a little bit of work done and next thing you know you look down there's little flecks of paint on your dockers. Oops. Do you have to seal Bragdon powder? I do. You don't have to, but I do. Just any, anything that's going to get handled. If it's going to be a structure, I wouldn't worry about it so much. Uh, but if it's a roll, piece of rolling stock where you may have to lift it up and you know from a derail or something like that from time to time, then yeah, I seal. Silco? Yeah. S sift, sift it on because if you spray it on, you wash out the you wash out the uh, Bragdon. You can. So, so yeah. Make sure you're at least a foot off. Yeah. But did you say you said spritz right now? Yeah. Ships. Yeah. Yeah. Not. Yeah. Okay. You're not, you're not talking about it. Do, do it. Do, do several of those. The first one's yeah. the most important one. Yep. Because you need to be be off of it, so it'll it'll put a coat on it. Then go back on an hour and and hit it with uh with a with a second so yeah have to even wait an hour drag i mean the yeah. gulf dries fast yeah don't don't get like right on top of it and be shooting it because you're right. going to blow it all off of there right. but like i'm talking like when i do it i'm i'm up, up here. here yeah and it's a couple of light passes let it dry a couple more light passes let it dry and i'm done you know yeah. and i do that after all my weathering's in all my powders are on all my pencils are on all my stains are on and for what it's worth my pecking order of weathering because i use all of these is i go stains first then I go powder, then I go with a little bit of pencil, and I use the pencil for highlights. You might be able to. Um, I've only tried that for different weathering effects. Uh, so if you're talking about a general application of color, you're probably going to waste a lot of paint because that sponge is going to suck up a lot of it and not give it back. Um, but for weathering effects, I like doing a lot of that, especially in the bigger scales because you can take uh, the cell foam type stuff and you can tear it 
and so you get a very jagged edge and then you can take that and dip it in just the paint dab most of it off on some paint on some paper and then come back in and hit that it's it's kind of like when they teach you how to do some of the faux paint jobs you know at home depot and all that it's kind of like the same process only down to scale so you're taking a little bit of foam tearing out the edge to get it roughed up get a little bit of paint dab it so off then come back in and and typically I don't do that in, in anything under S scale. And really only a, uh, only O and O. Because you, you end up with these lines and blotches that are just, when you scale them out, they're now this big round, you know, and it's just, nah. It's the same reason I don't like nail holes in HO. They're just too big. I mean, the whole thing is supposed to represent the head of that siding nail oxidizing. Well, the problem is by the time you take a pounce wheel and you run it across there, the head of that nails now is about that big around. It's just it's just not realistic. You're getting your homework done. All right, everybody got two walls painted. All right, now we're going to work on creating our L. We're going to glue two walls together. Now, first rule and big mistake modelers will make. You want to zoom in here, please? Yep. Any wall that has a peak on it needs to be on the outside of the joint. Okay. The reason for this is, if you glue the straight wall to the peaked wall, what you're going to end up with, and it's kind of still hard to see on here, you're going to have this bump out right here. The roof's going to come down this angle, and then it's going to hit that bump out, and it won't lay down. So you're going to have a gap on your roof. That is a big, big thing, and it's a hard one to fix. So the peaked wall always goes on the outside of the joint like this, so the roof will lay down flat. Okay, now notice I didn't paint the edges of my boards because they're not going to be seen. We're going to put trim over those and one of them is about to get glued on. You can use the glue of your choice. I know Leo Paletti likes using that pink flamingo stuff. I've not tried it yet. Um, I don't know what a little bitty bottle of that pink flamingo goes for, but that big bad boy of Aileen's Tacky Glue is $3 at Hobby Lobby when you're cheaper than that with your 40% off coupon. Uh, you can use carpenter's glue if you want. I know Mr. Palmer likes that. It is a permanent solution. If this is something that's going to get moved around, you might want to think about it for the extra strength, but if it's a possibility that it could get broken, you might want to give the Aileen's a rip because at least it's flexible and it will allow it to, to tweak a little bit without breaking. Now what I've done here is I take a little bit of Aileen's and I put it in the bottom of a shot glass. Like Alton Brown says, no unitaskers in my kitchen. I like this guy because it serves two purposes. Glue on one side, booze in the other. <laughs> Most shot glasses have a little dimple in the bottom. This makes a great well for your glue. Plus it's flared. It gets the glue up off your work surface. You can't turn it over and you can't stick your elbow in it without trying. If you just glue, put a little bit of glue on a piece of scrap or a piece of paper and you're sitting there working along and you're watching Game of Thrones Sunday night, something bad's going to happen. Your favorite character is going to get a knife through the throat and you're going to look down and your, uh, and your forearm's in the glue. Happens every time. Put it up in a shot glass, keeps it up out of the way, and it won't. you can't really turn it over unless you really try to. Okay. I'm using a toothpick because it's a little easier to see it on camera, well, in theory. Uh, I typically use a large head pin. If your wife does any sewing, go ask her for a head pin. That's the little straight sewing needle with a little round plastic ball on the end. If you really want to get something smart, go over to Hobby Lobby and tell them you're looking for quilting size head pins. They're longer and they have a little bit bigger ball on them, but they work really nice for as a glue applicator and they come with so many of them on there that you can probably buy one package and split them amongst all y'all and never run out of them. But a Plain old toothpick will work. I take a little bit of glue on the end of the toothpick, as you can see, maybe see here. And then I come in and I kind of lay it onto this edge of, I'm putting it on the longer wall, because that's going on the inside of the joint. And I'm just kind of dragging it off the toothpick onto the wall. You don't need a lot of glue on this. Squeeze out is uh, not something you're aiming for here. You want a fairly uniform bit of glue across there. And then after I get that on there, and watch this on the screen, guys. If you get a whole boatload of glue on here, I take my finger and my thumb, I lay the, pe the piece about halfway across my finger, put my thumb there, leaving a gap for that exposed glue, and I drag it across. 
using my finger as a seal and then any extra glue comes off on my finger it leaves just enough glue on the piece to glue it together and you don't end up with a whole lot of squeeze out. I take the two pieces and then mount them together. Long walls on the inside edge of the peaked wall. Okay. Now notice I'm just holding this in place right now. One of the things you're going to want to do is use something to square this up. Okay. Now I'm going to pull these apart because I don't want this drying. I'm going to run you through several different ways you can take and use these to square them up. Okay. You have, an, uh, one option is an assembly tray that you can buy from Micromark. This is one Mr. Mackey brought. I have two of these at the house. I used them for years. One of the things you're going to note with this one, um, somebody did to Mike's what, um, one mistake a lot of modelers do, there's gaps in the edges, in the corners. Those gaps are there on purpose. Don't try to close them up. The idea being is that if you're gluing two walls together that have a T intersection in it, you run one through the gap, you run this one up against it, and the walls are at a 90, and this will hold it up, and it comes with magnets. And you use the magnets then to push up against the walls and hold them in place, okay? This works really well. It's a handy little thing to have. If you work on models like I do, where you've got two or three of them going at once, buy them in pairs, buy the extra magnet sets to go with it because if you're working on something you can have one gluing up in this corner one gluing up in that corner if it's a fairly small structure or, if you're, or you're working an in scale where everything's a small structure you can have something gluing up in all four corners you're going to need more magnets um, i have gotten away from that however now if you're going on the cheap i believe mr grind's using legos over there you can build a box out of legos and make a 90 degree wall that works out really well as my kids graduated from the large mm. Duplo blocks to Legos, I swiped the Duplo blocks because the Duplos and Legos have 90 degree corners and they're plastic. And since I work mostly in wood, it doesn't stick to it. What you can do is you can line the piece up and typically I'll actually put them with the uh, mounting little nibs down and then I'll set the piece flat on the, on the floor here on the, on the tabletop surface and then I'll hold it in place with a clothespin that I've reversed and mount it that way. And then you can take your other wall and line it up and kind of do the same thing. And what you're, what you're doing right now is I'm testing it for fit. I'm making sure that I've got this first wall in place exactly where I wanted it to. And how about that? I got it first rattle out of the trap. Um, once you've got it where you know that's going to work, I still test my clamp to make sure. And, and this is something I picked up really building furniture. It, call it a clamping strategy because some of these things and some of these joints when you're building furniture can get really really complex and you've got you know a dozen or two dozen clamps going in they got to go in in a certain order and this allows you to plan that so I, once I get it where I know okay I've got enough clamps on it for what I'm going to do I'll take this one off and remove the long wall leaving this one where I left it because that has just enough exposed that when I slide this up against it I have a nice flush fit and with it resting on the table surface, it'll be flat and square in both planes. So then I'll come back, add the glue, slide these two parts together, clamp it in place, set it aside. Okay? Another option, and my personal favorite that I go with now that I've kind of graduated from the blocks, are these. These are made by Kaufman Graphics, and they call them a corner clamp. These are very, very handy. They are adjustable, so if you're putting together like a DPM structure with a large cornice, you can adjust this screw here and it will reach out over the cornice and then clamp back. One of the cool things about these is they have a little knurled nut up here that you can open the clamp up with and it has foam on here to protect your siding. It also has two openings right here in the back. Where this comes in handy is gluing in corner bracing. If you're not putting an interior in your building, we're going to brace the snot out of this thing. Something along these lines. I've got all sorts of bracing tucked into the first prototype that I built because I wanted to keep everything nice and straight. Um, another thing you can do when we talk about bracing, when you get a kit, you're going to find a lot of material like the carrier sheets, okay? Where this is a cutout from where I was cutting y'all's kits. If you get a regular kit, you'd have a full carrier sheet with all the parts in it. Well, most guys will pop that thing out and throw the sheet in the trash. <coughs> You're throwing away bracing material. 
especially stuff like this where if I cut this off flush and so where I just broke it off and it ended up like this one, that's a 90 degree corner, boys. You can take that, slide it up into the corner of your structure like this, and you've now got a very nice corner brace that will keep everything at a 90. But with the openings in these Kaufman clamps, you can take strip wood and cut it so it will fit just inside of this. So while the clamp is holding the wall itself in place, you can come back in and glue two pieces of strip wood inside that corner and let the whole thing dry and then back the clamp off after the glue's dried and it's already braced and glued together. And that's how I'm gonna put these together. So what I do with this is just like working with the Duplos, I put the, corner, the uh, peaked wall in first, I slide it in place and I just hold it with my fingers because I don't know yet how far I'm proud on this side. So it's a kind of a two-step process. So what I've done is I've slid the peaked wall in, I'll slide the long wall in that's gonna be on the inside of the joint. And when I have those lined up, I run it all the way down to the first screw, so hopefully it's level. That's the only disadvantage to this clamp is you may not necessarily be level across the bottom plane if you're not really, really careful. So I use that screw as a bit of a stop, okay? So I can see right now it's already slipped a little bit when I was tightening it, so I'm gonna loosen it back up. I tighten it back up, and then I tighten this screw down. So now the long wall is in place, okay? That will allow me to come back in here and align up the peaked wall exactly where it needs to go so I have the exact right amount of overhang. And I'll tighten it up just a little bit and it slipped in the tightening and it usually does. So I'm going back in, I'm making sure everything's nice and flush. Then I'm gonna put some finger pressure on it and then tighten it just a little bit further. Now my stuff is clamped in a perfect 90 degrees. So it's ready for glue. Now, before I glue anything, I'm gonna go ahead and take some strip wood here, and we're gonna cut a couple of pieces to act as reinforcement. You know the blade is dull and the scalpel won't cut. <laughs> so we're talking roughly about that long, and this isn't an exact science. You don't have to measure the opening and go, it is exactly seven and three quarter feet long, so I need to make this exactly seven and three quarter foot long. You don't, you eyeball it. It's corner bracing, it's just not that important. As long as it fits inside the opening of that uh, clamp, you're in great shape. All right, there's two of them. Set that over there. Do a little quick test fit. Yeah, only need the one. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'll bounce that out. I'm going to loosen the clamp on the side with the long wall and put my glue on. And again, if you didn't catch it the first time, I go into the glue, I do a little bit of a roll, and I get a nice little blob of glue on the end of the, the toothpick there. And then I come back in here and I just scrape it off the toothpick and kind of roll the toothpick kind of gently to expose more glue. And I typically drag it towards the back of the wood piece. Instead of toward the exterior, I, I drag it toward the interior. And you can see there, I got a pretty high spot of glue right here. Okay? So this is again where I come back in, finger and thumb, drag it back across here. And what's going to end up happening is I not only will I get a lot of the extra off on my fingers, it will actually take it and squeegee it down to maybe some of the places where you didn't quite have enough glue in it and help spread the glue out a little bit. Now I'm gonna open the clamp back up. I'm gonna slide this piece back in place. I'm gonna slide it up into, into the joint. I'm gonna come back over here now. I'm gonna hold this down, which I didn't do the last time, because I don't want it to slip while I'm tightening it up. And I'm gonna tighten this piece up. Now I'm gonna run my thumbnail across that joint, and I realize that I'm good out here on this edge, but my thumbnail's catching right here, which means I'm a little bit proud right there. So I'm gonna loosen this up just a little bit and I'm gonna shove it back flush and then tighten it back down and then I'm gonna test this. Now see, now I'm a little bit proud up there. So it's kind of a back and forth. And we've got it. Now I'm gonna take a little bit of glue here. I'm gonna set it down. And that's the nice thing about these clamps. Those two little screws protrude enough and with the knurl nut on there, you can just set the clamp upside down and it holds the pieces up off the work surface so you don't have any undue pressure going on it from gravity. I'm gonna take my bracing piece of material, 
I'm going to come in and add a little bit of glue on the back side of that. And then I'm going to take a negative tweezer. Now a negative tweezer is a tweezer that is closed until you open it and you press on it. I use these for all sorts of things in modeling. I have them in various lengths, various strengths it takes to open them. Uh, these are just God's secret gift to model railroaders, man. These things are awesome. And I use that to get it all the way down into the opening of the clamp there. I slide it down in. I'm going to open the tweezer up just a little bit to get on either side of the point and give it just a little bit of pressure to make sure that I've got it fully seated. And then I set it aside and let it dry. So if your bracing material is too big, you can crowd your window and screw that process. Yes, exactly. And we're going to talk about that here in just a minute too. Um, there's all sorts of different ways you can brace these things. Uh, I've got some of these coffee stirrers I was telling you about before. If you want some of these, I've got plenty. I brought two boxes of a thousand and they're both brand new. What I do with a lot of those is I take them and I glue them into a T-shape. So I'll take two of these and I will space one in the middle and glue a T together. Because then what's going to happen is as that wood wants to try to warp, it now has to fight the grain in two different directions of my brace piece to make it work. Now typically when I'm doing this, and I thought these were going to be bigger than they were, and had I had the ability to open a box up and see they were this small, I probably would have brought something different for bracing. Uh, I like them a little thicker. The ones we have at work are about 3 sixteenths of an inch wide, and they're about half again as thick. Um, so they're, they're really handy. Uh, Starbucks has wooden coffee stirrers that are kind of similar to these. Um, mo in fact, most of your coffee places do. Uh, if they still have the little red straws, those things are handy for pipe loads and things too, so don't discount those, but the wooden sticks are really, really nice. But uh, the little T little brace like that works really well. If you want some of these for that, you can. The other thing is to go over to Hobby Lobby, and like the right here is five pieces of 3 16 by 3 16 and they're two foot long. It's like three bucks. Makes great bracing material, and you don't even have to go that thick. Um, I've got 5 30 seconds by 5 30 seconds. Here's 1 8 by 1 8. Um, if I'm doing in scale for a customer, uh, I would probably go with the 1 8 or something a little bit smaller. Again, I'm, I want something in there to keep those walls straight. If you look at this one, in fact, I'll even pass this one around. This was the first pass at the redesign. You're going to see some pretty chunky stuff in here. Uh, you're going to see some square bracing stuck in here that's uh, some of it's got some polka dots on it. That's actually where I was cutting some bunks for a caboose and uh, had an extra one laying around and needed something perfectly square so I cut it in half and made two corner braces out of it so um, you got to be really careful when you're designing where this stuff goes if you want to have a door open dear God don't glue it across the doorway uh, if you've got windows and you're going to be able to see into the building at all don't cover the window if you're going to frost the window over and put a light on the inside still don't cover your window it's going to create a really nasty shadow what you do want to do, if you just want to put some blackout paper in it, you really don't care. But again, don't cover the window because you're still going to see it. When I do blackout paper, I don't like to put the paper right up against the window because you'll see the paper. Run a piece of, of dark. You can buy foam core in black. You can buy acrylic uh, styrene in black. You can take a 3x5 note card and color it with a Sharpie or airbrush it black and I put it at a 45 degree angle across the building. And what that does is it, you don't look at the window glass and see the, 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 not the fabric, but the texture of the paper. You look into the window and you see depth into the window and your brain says, that's a building, I can see inside it, I know there's an inside, their lights are off. And your brain's fine with it. When it sees the texture of the paper up against the glass, you go, huh, blackout paper, and you move on. But it just doesn't look right. I used to do it in a big U shape because the, 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 the pressure would hold it in. But again, you had it right up against the window. So now I'll glue a piece diagonally across it and we'll cover that depending on what you guys are aiming to do with your buildings. So you always, uh, that, uh, that freight depot you have, mm -hmm. top brace and a bottom brace. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much the recommended method. Um, it depends on how the building is, how the siding has reacted to paints and stains. The plywood doesn't tend to warp a lot. It will warp some, depending. I keep my stuff stored flat. I don't stand it up uh, because it has to be as dead flat as possible. But even then, I'll find some of that plywood has got enough of a bow in it that I'll have to cut this little section in one drawing, 
take some weights, and usually I, I go to the dollar store and I buy decks of cards for a buck, and they've got just enough weight, but it's it's not taller than the clearance needs to be, so the laser can move over the top of it if it needs to. And I'll weight the board down, cut another section in a piece of artwork, it'll stop, I'll put a couple more weights in it, and then I'll run the last piece of it if I have to. I really try to avoid that if I can, because it gets really dicey. Um, but a lot of times, if I'm not going to put an interior on one for sure, I'll brace the snot out of that thing. Can just because I don't want it to move. Can you get some of those sticks? Wayne, you were talking about the bracing yeah. in a T, but as I'm looking at this, I see an L. Yeah, I didn't do any T bracing on that one. Because that's all strip wood. And I didn't do it with the coffee stirrer. That's a coffee stirrer down there. Uh, but I didn't glue that into the T. I was, I was, I was going on the quick. Can we have but yeah. Coffee stirrers? Yeah. That's pretty slick. That worked pretty good. Yeah. Oh yes, this is one of the new clamps. Yeah. Uh, that's a Walther's thing, isn't it? I forget where it was. No, those are Bachman. Bachman? Okay. Uh, actually, pro, uh, yeah. Prosser. This is one of the new clamps that's available. Oh, yeah. And it comes up in a little Y shape. That's cool. And I've not had a chance to try them. Did it actually look pretty good? Yeah, oh yeah, they yeah, were. Yeah, they were. Yeah. Who's it by Bachman? The name is Prosser. Yeah. Yeah. Prosser like the people? Prosser. Yeah. Hey, you yeah. 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 Well, thank you. No, he never has and he never will. But I'm used to it. In the work you're going to need some bigger material. Are you sure? It's good that you got your. I don't get bastard. Uh, Balsa only has one thing for model railroading and one thing on the She left early this morning to get away with it. It's not strong enough to fight the work is the big problem. If you need more, you think you're going to need more, please come ask. I took. I took a half inch out of one box and I have two boxes. So if you really <laughs> want some more, you know, come let me know. You can we can, we can send you home with a pretty good bit of them. I'll take some. Let's see, Mr. G scale. Yes, brace with two or two, doesn't he? Yeah, pretty much. Um, hey Randy, I've got some three eighths by three eighths up here. I would recommend you get something like that to brace yours. Um, it's like four bucks for two sticks of it over at Hobby Lobby, and it's uh, basswood. So if you want to cut it, uh, cut it with a razor saw and a miter box, <coughs> and just cut it the length. Um, I would really recommend on yours because you've got a lot of surface area there. You might go one at the bottom, one at the top, and as much across the middle as you can without covering up your openings. Um, now, see, you're wanting to put an interior in yours. Now, are you going to have like the doors <coughs> standing open and things like that, or are you just going to have some things in the inside and have it lit? I'm going to put some chandeliers in it. Okay. <laughs> okay. But, you, but, but you're just going to be able to see through the windows? Yeah. Okay. Any window you can see through, and you're going to have to do a little plotting and planning on this, think about mm -hmm. what you can you know, put the put the two walls together and stand it up and look inside and see what all you can see. And if you've got the advantage of this, put it where it's going to go and look in and see what you can see. And then you're going to have to plan your bracing around it. Because you don't want to have a big old brace sticking out of the wall up there. And when you look in, go, why on earth is there like a foot square timber sticking out of the wall up there? <laughs> so, so you have to give that some thought. It's, it's all about what you can see and what you can't. I mean, if you're not going to have the big door standing open, you know, that, that freight door, you're look, you'd be looking through an opening like this, you'd be able to see quite a bit in there. Uh, but if the, if the doors themselves are going to be closed where you're just looking through the windows, you might be able to get away with one at the bottom pretty easily because you won't be able to see down into it. The upper one you might be able to get away with. It kind of depends. Uh, some interiors, I'll put a ceiling in them and then put lights through the ceiling. And what I'll do is I'll glue two braces at the very top of the wall and then I glue my ceiling up against that. So then you have the advantage of having it braced up and down with that and then the ceiling in place. Sir? I was going to ask if these buildings typically have ceilings. 
the most it depends on the railroad uh the ones in colorado do at least the ones i've been in um silverton's a good example chama's a good example over in new mexico uh, durango's i think is open up at the, toward the top or at least a good ways up um a little bit vaulted you could do it either way depending on how you want to do it i mean like when i did this one for dad i, I did it with the roof removable and i did roof trusses in here but then my roof material took a warp with all the the glue on here um, I didn't do the, I didn't have a good source for double, the, that real thin double face tape that we used over in the D3 clinic. And uh, so it took a warp and uh, so I, then I had to brace, put two big braces through here. So it kind of ruins the look a little bit, but uh, it's going on dad's layout. So I'm not worried about it. If it's going to the contest room or going on my layout, I'd, I'd do a new roof. Hey, he's getting a free depot out of it. He won't complain. Hey, this roof's got a little, that shingles have got a little black around the end. Yeah. What is that? How'd you do that? I did it with the laser. With a laser. That is, that is, la those are laser cut shingles. Individual? Individual. Now, what we're going to do is three tab, and I'm going to laser cut those. Okay. Um, if these are laser cut to more look like wood, so they're all individually drawn. What I did was I drew um, like four different strips of shingles. And then I took them and split them and reversed them mixed and matched them so i came up with about i think by the time it's all said and done about 20 different individual rows that are really hard to tell one from the other and then i cut those out so it cuts them at a little bit of an angle and kind of a random edge shape so you get that older shake look and then uh, i cut those out so i did those with that and all that is is a brown almost a brown paper sack color uh scrapbooking paper that i bought over at hobby lobby run through the laser and when I pulled it out I realized that the smoke had blackened some of it and I'm like that's a slick look I like it mm -hmm. so um, I ended up just just running with it I, I'm really happy with the look toys. I could do sometimes it works out yep yeah. happy mistakes so all right boys and girls how we looking but everybody got a wall a couple walls glued together Very cool. You can. Yeah, however you want to brace it. It is strictly up to you. Yep. It's it's one of those, it's a learning experience and just dive in. It's again just be be kind of thinking about what do I plan to do with it. If I'm just gonna put blackout paper in it, then brace it up all over the place because you're never gonna see it. You know? Yeah, now if you're looking for toothpicks and stuff, uh, the dollar store is your friend. You can get them you can get a package like these and it comes with a little dispenser so you can have it where you can pour a whole bunch out or add a whole bunch more in it or it's got another one you twist it around and you can dispense them like one at a time and I got like two of these things full of toothpicks for a buck and then my son of course knocked over a can of uh, any ink and alcohol so a lot of mine have, uh, have uh, they're, yeah they're pre-weathered um, but these are pretty cool another one that you can find in some of the grocery stores is a toothpick where it's only got the point on one end and then it's kind of knurled on the upper end yeah. and I need to find a box of those so if somebody finds a box of those cracker barrel, cracker barrel? okay um, okay uh, yeah porch posts they make great porch posts yeah so uh, especially for s scale the man they make awesome porch posts for s scale um, Uh, I was thinking three tab shingle, unless you want to do something different. Do what? Three tab asphalt. You want to do yeah. The, the cut cut them with the wood is exceedingly more time consuming on the laser because it's got to make all these little bitty jagged cuts. Where the other way you can go zip 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 zip. Uh, depends on what color you want your roof to be. When I try to do three tab in my kits, I typically do it in white paper if I can get it. And I use a paper that's designed for people that do pastel arts. Uh, it's got just a little bit of texture to it. Um, that seems to work pretty good for HO and up. Uh, I'll have to do some scouting around to see what I can find for uh, the in-scale crowd because that texture is a little too much for in-scale. Um, but I will find some material. And I like doing it in white because it allows you to paint the roof whatever color you want it to be. Um, paper. And we're going to put this stuff on. Uh, Mr. Division Director. Uh, I have a source to buy that 3M double face tape by a box by the box load. It's about 45 bucks for a box, and there's about 12 rolls of that tape in a box. That transfer tape. That transfer tape. It's made by 3M. 
uh, it's it is it is the only way to put shingles on a roof or sheet metal on a roof for that matter. I'll buy a roll of it. I'll buy yeah. a roll of it. Uh, I'll tell you what I'll do, guys. I'll lay in a couple of boxes of that, and if you want to buy a roll, um, I'll have to look. But we'll, I'll do the math on it and whatever it comes out to be costs. Because I'm getting it from Amazon, and you buy it by the box, it's cheaper. And I'm on Prime, so I get free shipping. So I'll just figure out whatever the, it is and you know, cost per roll kind of deal. And you'll have leftover. It does not take that much to do a, to do a roof. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Always got to be one, don't yeah. you? You just got to be. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking tar paper roof for years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for a depot, you probably wouldn't want to go with tar paper. Uh, tar paper roofs are real easy to do, though. Uh, rice paper. Get rice paper. You can buy that at Hobby Lobby in, a, in big pads. And you can cut it into three-foot wide strips. And uh, you can scale glue that down. Yeah, scale three foot wide. <laughs> and uh, you can lay that down in strips. And you put it on just like you do shingles. Start at the bottom, put down one course, slightly overlay it, and put up the next one. And I shoot it with grimy black paint out of the airbrush and then glue it down. Uh, if you don't have the rice paper and you're working in one of the larger scales, um, S it works pretty nice. Uh, o it really looks nice in O is take a, um, uh, buy Kleenexes without aloe or any of the other little add-on gel stuff in them, just plain old Kleenexes, and they're two-ply. Pull it apart so you have one ply each, and hit that with the grimy black paint, and then lay that down. It has a little more texture to it, and for the bigger scales, it really makes nice, nice-looking tar paper. But for HO and N, rice paper is the only way to fly, and a pad of that stuff will last you your entire life. It will do every structure on your layout and probably every structure on a couple of friends' layouts and still leaving some in your will. I mean, it's a little, it, it does not take much to do a roof.